Stop us if you've heard this one before. Anonymous sources in Washington quoted in the U.S. media over purported intelligence reports on specific but unspecified threats from a Middle Eastern country. And this, a buildup of U.S. military forces around said country because, as the narrative goes, somehow maximum pressure, perhaps even war, is the best way to bring peace to the region. This would not be the first time the American media, wittingly or unwittingly, has made the case for war on the basis of vague, anonymously sourced intelligence. In 2003, it was Iraq. This time, it's Iran. Much of American news reporting on U.S.-Iran relations glosses over President Trump's role, how his policies have led to this standoff. There's even less space given to reflect on the history of American aggression against Iran. Which is not to say that the Islamic Republic, ruled by authoritarians and involved in wars in Syria and Yemen, is an innocent player. However, inflammatory headlines, unnamed sources, and decades of misinformation in the U.S. media over Iran don't help. Our starting point this week is Washington, D.C. Headlines like these about Iranian belligerence and new tensions with the U.S. came from sources like these. The official who declined to be identified. The three U.S. officials familiar with the findings. A defense official who spoke on condition of anonymity because they were not authorized to speak publicly. It's a safe bet, though, that the official was authorized to speak anonymously. If we were to write a headline on the coverage of this story, it would read... Anonymous government sources, U.S. news media risks being manipulated again. All of a sudden, you have a news headline that takes over the world, which comes from a, a rather dubious and questionable sourcing. Uh, but by the time that people start asking questions, it's already too late because the narrative has been framed. One has to take into account that a single source story can potentially start a disastrous confrontation. And this really, I think, increases the burden of responsibility on journalists to make sure that they double check and they triple check their sourcing. Media outlets relying on certain sources is not something peculiar or uncommon. On the contrary, it occurs worldwide, whether in the US or elsewhere. This is especially true when the matters relate to state security or intelligence, which always involves particular sources who can provide verification or information. There was a Wall Street Journal report on the threat from Iran. What seemed very interesting is that the headline was almost the exact opposite of what the story was describing. Along the reporting, you would see points and information that would refute the actual conclusion that one would get from the headline. There's a good uh, part of the audience that only sees the headlines on their phones, on the website, and then they move on to the next story. Those headlines have been largely based on two things. A U.S. intelligence report that was first reported upon on May the 6th, and gunboat attacks against four oil tankers, two of them Saudi, that took place a few days later and have been blamed on Iran or its proxies. The intelligence report has not been made public. Its contents have reportedly been described to various news outlets by those anonymous officials who talk about specific but unspecified threats from Iran against American interests in the region, including U.S. forces in Iraq and Syria. For media watchers, observers of American foreign policy and victims of those policies, moving on is not an option because of memories of Iraq. Anonymous sources were an issue back then too, as was dubious intelligence, vague claims of Iraqi WMDs. He develops weapons of mass destruction. That the US media swallowed far too readily and obediently. If, if he gets weapons of mass destruction, Jerry, if what, does he, that mean, if, what does that mean for the world? Iraq 2003 is considered the greatest collective failing in the history of American journalism. And it is far too soon to see those kinds of editorial practices in use 
once again. The U.S. media was not critical at all of the George W. Bush administration um, in the lead up to the Iraq war, even though there were multiple sources outside of the U.S. government saying that there is no evidence that Iraq had weapons of mass destruction. And in this instance, we are seeing the same sorts of attributions begin again when in the U.S. media they're talking a lot about uh, threats from Iran, and yet they're not providing um, much intel about that. We are now dealing with people in the Trump administration like John Bolton who have a long track record of trying to politicize intelligence to advance their agenda. Our goal should be regime change in Iran. So the burden of responsibility is really on the shoulders of the journalists to go beyond the Trump administration and try to talk to U.S. allies in the region uh, and the Iranians also to get their perspective. In the news business, context matters, and it's largely missing in the U.S.-Iran coverage. For most Americans, this conflict goes back to 1979, the Islamic Revolution, and the subsequent hostage-taking of 52 Americans in Tehran, held captive in their embassy for 444 days. But it's what led to the 1979 hostage crisis that Iranians remember. 1953, and the U.S.-led coup that brought down the government of Prime Minister Mohammad Mossadegh and reinstalled the autocratic Shah of Iran, who would rule his people for a quarter century. But there's even more to U.S.-Iran history, such as the role that America played in the Iran-Iraq War in the 1980s, when the Reagan administration helped Saddam Hussein's forces and his army used chemical weapons. At least 100,000 Iranians were casualties of that. Despite that long, troubled backstory, in 2015, Iran came to an agreement with the US, the EU, and five other countries, in which it agreed to limit its national nuclear program in exchange for the lifting of economic sanctions. The Iranians stuck to their end of the deal. The Trump administration did not pulling out of the pact last year unilaterally. But U.S. news outlets that are usually not shy with their criticism of President Trump provide him with much more leeway on foreign policy than on domestic issues. When it comes to domestic politics, especially under the Trump administration, the U.S. mainstream media has been quite good at trying to be critical of the administration and what it's doing. But the president's 2020 budget proposal dead on arrival. What is the political strategy behind this move? But when it comes to foreign policy, traditionally U.S. mainstream media does not really push back and try to understand the bigger context of why are we even going to engage in something like this. But a U.S. government official tells CBS News this category of weapon is routinely supplied by Iran to its proxies in Iraq. Iran's uh, policies in the region are often uh, described as malign, nefarious, destabilizing, as if everybody else's actions in the region are benign and stabilizing. Uh, look at what Saudi Arabia has done in Yemen in the past four years. Look at what the U.S. did in the region by uh, destabilizing Iraq. So I think this kind of demonizing Iran and portraying Iran as the source of all evil in the region uh, is, by definition, a hype, uh, and by definition results in misguided policies that could produce another tragedy like the Iraq War. What nobody had to cover in 1953, 1979, or in 2003 with Iraq was an American commander-in-chief on Twitter, effectively negotiating with a major foreign state on a microblogging site. Donald Trump, not the most articulate president the U.S. has ever produced, can be remarkably clear and forceful on Twitter. However, diplomacy is not easily conducted when the players are limited to 280 characters or fewer. From the very beginning, Trump has used Twitter as a tool in his campaign, but he now uses it to make statements that differ from his actual policies. When he threatened North Korea with fire and fury, he did so to restart negotiations. While the latest threats by Trump obviously make headlines as he's the US president, they are no longer conceived as shocking, so his strategy is no longer as effective. 
Now I know President Trump has used that on North Korea and it has worked and it seems like he's trying to use the same blueprint for Iran to eventually get them to the negotiating table like he did with Kim Jong-un. But the Iranian leadership thinks very differently than the North Koreans. They are not looking for a legitimacy photo up on the world stage with President Trump. They don't want to negotiate with him publicly. They've said it numerous times because they say he's been disrespecting them and his Twitter is actually an important part of this uh, entire disrespect campaign that Iranians are talking about, if not the main pillar of it. Donald Trump would not be the first occupant of the White House accused of using Iran as a useful distraction from domestic political troubles. In a stream of tweets in 2012 and 13, Americans were warned that Barack Obama was preparing to do the same thing, to start a war with Iran in order to get elected, to save face. All written by Donald J. Trump. That kind of context hasn't made it into the headlines, but it's a big part of the story.